It's a real pleasure to have uh, Leonora Balai today with us um, presenting her work. Um, Leonora is an instructor in the Department of Neurosurgery at Mass General Hospital and Harvard Medical School. Um, she's been working on EVs for more than 10 years now since her PhD um, and her work uh, has uh, provided very important contributions to the field uh, both in the biology and in the development of platforms to um, quantify and characterize um, extracellular vesicles for liquid biopsy. So today she's going to talk about characterization of plasma extracellular vesicles uh, following the five uh, ALA uh, therapy in malignant glioma. Go ahead. Great. Okay. So yeah, thank you again, um, uh, Car Carolina and Dolores for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here and, and to see some familiar faces and, and some also meet some virtually meet some, some new faces. So as Dolores mentioned, I've been working in this field for a few years. Um, uh, it was painful when I had to write that 10 year number. It's, it's, it's yeah, years have, have gone by. Um, and I'll also disclose that I'm hiding in the basement from my kids here. So in case you start hearing some noises, it's just my kids, but they know how to sit next to me on the Zoom call as well. So hopefully that won't be too much of a distraction. So I've, I've worked in this field, like I said, for a few years. I have looked at the EV biology, but also a little bit of biomarker work. Um, today, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a different story that we have developed in the last, I see, year and a half. Um, we started by looking at this compound, the 5 that I'm telling you about. Um, and it's, it's a really interesting tool that can be explored in many different ways. And today I'm just going to show you how we've used that in the plasma of uh, patients that uh, undergo the surgery. So uh, we all know that EVs are important. Um, just to set the stage here, obviously they do a lot of things. They are involved um, in, in, in as basic uh, messengers. They travel around and they bring their messages and they're involved in all of these processes here. They have proteins inside, outside, and this is just, just a visual uh, picture here of what, what would look like, um, what these uh, EVs would look like on top of a GBM cell. This is a primary uh, glioblastoma cell. So um, we and others obviously have explored this field for, for years now to try and look and see if we can uh, um, use these vesicles in the uh, plasma or in serum or CSF in, in, the, in all biofluids to, to really help us uh, improve the treatment of, of these patients. Uh, glioblastoma, as you know, is quite, it's, it's, it's a pretty uh, terrible disease uh, with immediate survival of about 15 months. So looking at liquid biopsies obviously would open many avenues to try and, and improve care for these patients. Um, so the way we're trying to, uh, the answers and in general we're trying to answer, uh, the questions we're trying to answer with, with this, uh, this platform is, well, does a patient have a tumor? Is it a confirmed tumor? If it is, can we tell the, the genetic subtype? Um, do we, can we find out anything about the tumor burden? Um, can we tell anything about responsive therapy? Imagine all the avenues that this could be used in, in clinical trials. Um, and uh, is a tumor recurring, which is obviously where uh, all patients will um, will die uh, when that tumor comes back. So uh, you can focus your work early in the stages, but also later on, obviously, are, are, there's a lot of need uh, in all of this. So, um, so, so far, uh, we, we obviously started early on when we didn't even know about vesicles in, in circulation, but for the longest time, as we, when we started this work, we typically looked at all EVs, right? And now, as we all know, there's this push in trying to understand single EVs and tumor-derived EVs and subpopulations of EVs. And so this is a little bit the story that I'm going to be telling you about. And so can we pull out these tumor EVs specifically from the plasma or for a biofluid, from a biofluid and try to understand them better? So what we did here, um, you, we use this 5-ALA. 5-ALA uh, is a compound that uh, in the U.S. it's been approved, I think, two years ago now. And um, it's... Um, it's quite intriguing. It's a, it's, it's a compound that patients will drink um, and then uh, about a two, three hours prior to surgery. And um, when the, they go into the OR, they open the, 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 the skull, you actually will, under a blue light, you will see a fluorescent tumor. So um, 
the way, I don't know, I have, have a picture here, but the way this happens is that the, this 5-ALA compound here uh, goes through the um, uh, processing of it in the cell, in the, in the mitochondria actually. And one of the intermediary molecules is called protoporphin 9, which is a, a, a naturally fluorescent molecule. And that's the one we're looking for. So the patient will take 5-ALA, that gets converted into protoporphin 9, and that's the fluorescent that we're looking for in these, uh, in, that you'll see in the tumor. And then later we want to ask if that happens, in, it's also found in EDs. So briefly, a patient will drink this uh, 5-ALA about two to four hours. Um, this accumulates in, in malignant gliomas, um, probably a little bit because of um, the disease itself, but also a little bit of, uh, of the biology that's changed in tumor cells, uh, where some of, these, some of the, the molecules that will convert this 5-ALA are up or down regulated. So the end result is really that risk results in, in a lot of accumulation in glioma tissues. And it, all of these studies have been done for the clinical trial, so there's pretty, pretty good evidence that this doesn't accumulate in other tissue or cells. Um, so it, as I said, it gets metabolized into this protoporphin 9, um, and then during the surgery, the neurosurgeon is able to see this uh, pink tissue that um, delineates a tumor. And this is how it look like, looks like. So this is how a white light in illumination, you'll see a tumor. But if you have a blue light, you actually see um, uh, all surrounding tissue. And I also have a little uh, video here that you guys can take a look, um, if you don't mind. For some of you, maybe a bit too early to look at this. But um, so this would be under the blue light. So you see all the pink tissue. So that would be tumor. And then soon you'll see the white light coming up and you'll see that everything will look the same. And again, with the blue light, you'll see again that most of that pink area um, has been removed. Here you go. So the obvious question for us as uh, EV enthusiasts were, was, okay, this is being used for tumors, but will these tum fluorescent tumor cells now also secrete vesicles that do contain this protoporphin 9 in them? Um, and um, I should just mention that some of the work that I'm going to be talking about has been published, and we did this a few months ago, and you're um, welcome to go back and look at this paper. Um, so what we, the first thing we did, we obviously was to try and optimize our protocols to really convince ourselves that uh, what we see are real particles um, and that uh, we can, that, that we have a robust uh, product method to really study them. So we use something called imaging flow cytometry. Um, this is an amnes instrument that we were lucky to have actually just next door in our lab. Um, and this is showing you just the preliminary uh, settings that we use. So we start by picking here by looking at the uh, stable microfluidics. Uh, this is extremely sensitive, so really a lot of things can go wrong in this. But if you, if you select the area where the uh, flow is, is pretty stable, then you get the, your particles all in this area. And we sorted them based on uh, aspect ratio. So Basically, that means we don't want really big things. If they are really big, probably they're not these vesicles that we're looking for. And then once we excluded these really large uh, vesicles here, we moved on to exclude the beads here, the speed beads. These are internal controls. We removed um, fluorescent aggregates that are also showing up here. Um, we non-fluorescent events. So if there anything that really is showing up but we, it's not positive in this channel where this fluorescent shows up, also removed. And that what we end up with at the end is this R3 population that you see down here in red, which are vesicles that are small enough in size. Um, they have low scatter, uh, scattering um, characteristics, so they're relatively small, but they're also fluorescent. 
right? You can see them in channel 11 here. So this way we are pretty sure that we're looking at the right population that we're looking for. And, and obviously this is really critical, I think, for, for, for this type of work. So we also, in, um, in, in parallel before we got to vesicles, obviously we tried many types of beads, different size beads, a combination of different size beads, um, our PBS, buffer controls, um, just a few optimization here. We used a lot of liposomes, different range, different size. You can see here our PBS control, 100, 200 nanometer. We tried to mix them. And interestingly here, you, you can see that it's not super easy to separate 100 from a 200 nanometer size. Um, but uh, maybe there is something in there. As you can see, the 100 looks quite different from the 200. And then when you mix them, this is what you get. And then um, 100 and 200 here, when you lice them, you actually see these events uh, disappearing, which was uh, very important to us as a control. And we performed that control, I'd say, um, um, throughout our work. So this is showing you EVs. Um, so again, as a confirmation, these are, this is a GBM cell line. So when you add your lyses, um, Sorry, this slide should have come a little bit later, but just to confirm that even when we count EVs, we are able to lyse all of them. So with your lysis control, you will um, have them disappear. So um, what we did then, once we have this protocol that's working well, we went to our cell lines, we tried this in, in, may, in mice as well as in patient samples. So in cell lines, the first thing we to, what to do was to confirm that what we see is actually specific to gliomas or at least is enriched, right? This has been proven, but let's try it in our cell lines. And as you can see here, when you treat your 5-ALA cells with um, 5 ALA, your glioma cells with 5-ALA, you'll see this 247-fold increase in the presence of these uh, uh, protoporin, protoporin positive particles um, and, and as compared to your mock treated cells. Um, when you do this in the same, in control cell lines, and these are cells that are uh, not tumorigenic, they are uh, human brain microvascular endothelial cells, um, you see some increase, but it's nowhere near to this 247 fold that you see here. Um, the next thing we did was to see if we should, should we try direct vesicles in here, since we were already in a way purifying and sorting them or analyzing them because we're, we're, we're gating out all these large vesicles. So we wondered what happens if we try direct media versus a kit. So we did this in parallel. Um, we tried 100 microliters of media here. And you can see again with 5LA or mock treated or the commercial kit. And uh, you can see here the amount, this is 20 ml of media that has been obviously isolated and concentrated down to some smaller amounts. And you can see that with 100 microliters of just direct condition media, we get about 50,000 events and we get a relatively similar number with the kit. And so this is in a way, I guess, telling us two things. The first thing is that we, um, we the kit obviously is not, uh, isolating all of the vesicle. But the second important thing is um, the idea that this fluorescent is really unstable uh, in uh, white light. So it disappears quite quickly. And this is what it, this experiment shows, is that if you have um, no exposure to light, you preserve all these fluorescent events. But if you have white, uh, white light, uh, this was uh, 20 minutes, I think, at the room temperature in, in the hood. And uh, you see that uh, these events uh, drop significantly. So this is the other thing that we learned uh, while doing this work, that all our work had to be done in the dark and covered and fast, and so that there was no exposure to light. And uh, this was also applied to the samples, that the patient samples that we collected, as you'll see later on. And I'll just mention that we, we actually have access to samples that were collected over four or five years while the 5-ALA trial was happening in, in the US. There was a research arm to look at biomarker studies and we were super excited to try all of those samples, except that based on this experiment and, and some other data we had, um, we realized that probably most of those samples don't have any 5-ALA, any protoporphin positive vesicles in there because they have not been um, kept away from light and in, in the darkness. So um, unfortunately, some of the samples that we tried, none of them worked. Um, so, the next thing we did was, well, let's see if uh, we can prove this in, in, uh, in glioma patients, in glioma uh, mice models as well. So we took a few, um, two or three glioma, control mice, so no tumor, and uh, I think three and three uh, glioma mice. 
where we injected a tumor. Um, no, we did not. This is an endogenous model. So in glioma and control mice where they have a, a, a brain tumor, and um, you'll see the, again, pre-5-ALA. So we always measure pre and post. So pre-5-ALA, you have this number of events here, about 17,000, post about 10,000. And where there is a tumor, you get about 12,000. And it pre, while in the post, you go up to 65,000. And you can see that represented here as well. So again, quite um, uh, um, uh, um, proof for us that we actually, what we are seeing is coming from the tumor. And then the last thing we did for this study was to show that uh, this works in patient samples. And again, as I said, unfortunately, a lot of the samples that we had, we could not use. So we had to rely on samples that were collected at our institution and with the proper protocol. So that's why we only ended up with six samples, um, but it was really encouraging. And as, as you'll show, it actually worked really well. So these patients, as I said, they were uh, operated on at MGH and our CRC would run to the OR, pick up a sample, keep it in the dark. And um, these patients are also kept in the dark for up to 48 hours after surgery. That's one of the challenges why uh, it's not used, 5LA is not used more widely. One of the challenges, there are others, um, including apparently cost and all of that. But um, uh, so we get these samples in the, in the lab and then we process them immediately in the dark. And then the processing, by the way, can be done on fresh samples or frozen. We really have not seen a drop in, uh, in fresh or frozen. So, um, and so we store our samples and then we analyze it. We ended up with six patients that had all of them glioblastoma. Like I said, this is uh, pretty specific for high grade, higher grade gliomas. Um, and at least the FDA label at, at this point is for high-grade gliomas, but there are studies underway to try and understand how this works in other types of um, lower-grade gliomas or other tumors. So you see the patient characteristics here, you see the tumor volumes, and uh, what you'll notice here is that we had four patients that were classified as fluorescent intraoperatively, and two of them that, were, that did not fluoresce. And, um, the reason why they did not is uh, sometimes that happens and it could be maybe it's a lower grade tumor. Um, that's one issue. Um, timing could be an issue. So you have to time it properly because there is a peak where this conversion of 5LA into protocorphin happens. And then if you're too early or too late, you may miss that window. Um, another reason why this may not may happen is that if the tumor is very uh, necrotic, uh, it will actually not convert this 5LA into protocorphin 9. So we think for our patients, there it was a combination of the tumor being quite necrotic and um, timing issue. Uh, nonetheless, these, these samples did not for us. So we have four and two that ended up being our good uh, positive internal controls, our, our, our negative controls, I guess. Um, and so what we did then here was to look at the 5-ALA, protoporphin 9 EVs. And as you, see, as you see here in pre 5 ALA versus post, you see this really nice increase in the plasma EVs that are positive for this uh, uh, fluorescence. And the other remarkable thing that we actually noticed is that there was a, quite an interesting correlation with the tumor size. Again, really confirming that what we see is coming directly from the tumor. Um, so this was really exciting for us. Um, and obviously we are trying to uh, develop this a little bit further. Um, so the, so I was also just going to mention that this Im, um, imaging flow cytometry has been used for other, um, in other studies. Uh, so we are using a really unique system because we're not labeling the vesicles. This is all endogenous. Um, but a lot of studies have used them uh, with, with um, uh, exogenous labeling. So in this one, for example, they've labeled uh, vesicles for surviving marker, CD9, GFAP, and they've tried to um, follow patients over time with, with, a, with a vaccine therapy. Um, and this is also interesting. There's another study that also Franz uh, Rick Lefts has published, and there have been quite a few follow-ups as well, where he has shown that, again, using the same system, imaging flow cytometry, you can label the vesicles. He has used CD63, CD81, and you can um, quantify them either in cell lines or in plasma. And so the system works, um, it's, but it requires obviously its own calibration system, optimizations and all of that. Um, 
the differences between labeling antibodies and the 5 ALA is that obviously, again, antibodies, you need the extra processing and the extra steps where you can lose your vesicles. With a 5 ALA, we're just, just reading what's happening in the plasma directly being released from the tumor. So the other thing that we've tried to do is in parallel is um, obviously the obvious question is, if you can detect these, can you also sort them and can you study them? So we are fortunate to have um, one of these instruments, not in our institution, but in a different institution, but here in Boston, uh, Yonita Giran has one of these. There's a core over there that we can use. Um, and so this one allows you to sort your vesicles. So um, we have, uh, um, we, in collaboration with them, we made sure that we had the same channel that we have used for IFC imaging flow cytometry, so we could translate our work here. So we ran our own controls and calibration needs to make sure that what we see in IFC, we also see here. So we, and then we thought, so let's try, and uh, these are uh, just some background experiments to show you how we can uh, differentiate down to 100 nanometers of these vesicles using this uh, sorting system now. Um, so again, using the sorting system, if you take the same cell lines, the same EVs that we characterize in IFC, and you uh, bring them to the system, you're able to see in uh, five ALA treated cells, this uh, uh, protoporphin nine positive population, and, and you don't see that here in the mock treated cells. Um, just wanna point out that uh, IFC obviously is so unique and, and um, so powerful because you can see each event, right? And you can, you're able to study each event and you can actually click on it and look at the size of it and see if it's true event if you are suspicious. Most of the flow cytometers, you just see the population, right? So that's, that's a little bit of the difference. But here we can sort, and so that's great. So we did that, and we did that in cell lines first. So we took um, glioma cells again. In this case, uh, these are GLI-36 cells, wild type. Um, we call them wild type because they have a wild type EGFR. In parallel, we also have GLI-36 cells that have this uh, oncogenic form of EGFR, which is the EGFR V3. Um, so we, you're, we're comparing here mock treated versus 5-ALA treated cells, and we're counting the protoporphin positive events. And um, as you can see in the mock treated, you barely see any events, while the 5-ALA, you have this uh, drastic increase of the events. Um, and here you can quantify exactly, so you actually know how many vesicles you're getting from these events. And you can imagine how many really cool experiments you can do where you can uh, run PCRs and try to quantify the copies for these, for these events of RNA or, or um, microRNA or all the things that you're, you're interested in. And again, this is not answering the questions about all EVs being secreted by one cell, but it is a subpopulation of EVs where at least we can perform some characteristic studies. Um, the other thing that I want to say that I'm not showing here, again, just uh, some, some data here that I'm sharing with you, but we have done work where we've tried uh, to co-label things. So maybe 5-ALA, uh, maybe CFDA, uh, which is a more of a pan-ED marker. Uh, we've used another uh, glioma marker, which was tenacin C. We've used EDFR, E3. So we can also um, understand uh, the, how many, the, the, the number of EVs of subpopulation of EVs that have uh, markers in common. So for example, we know that of say, if assuming pan, uh, CFDA labeled 100% of EVs, we know that about 70, 70 of those are 5-ALA positive. So about 30 of, out of 100, about 30 of these do not include 5-ALA or protoporphin 9, sorry. So um, even in this system, like we, we can tell we can tell that not all of these obviously are created equal. So uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of differences. And this is a system where we can really explore that, uh, those um, studies. Um, the other thing that I'd like to point out is, which is uh, really interesting when I saw this, is that these are the same cell lines, except that one of them contains the EGFR V3 marker. And, and these are the same number of cells. So normalize the number of cells, normalize as much as possible to, to, to the system and the way you isolate them. And look at the difference in the actual EVs that you get from one cell line versus the other. So this is the oncogenic cell line. And this reminded me of uh, Janusz actually. Janusz talked last Monday where, again, we have the idea that the, including an oncogene, uh, you'll you know, make the cell 
um, you, you'll increase the oncogeneity or, or uh, so in a way this is also proving that point because you have a lot more vesicles assuming these vesicles are more oncogenic but at least you have in absolute numbers you have a lot more vesicles being secreted by this cell line as, compa as compared to the wild type uh, counterpart um, so we've also tried this one in, in the plasma of patients so this is a patient uh, that uh, obviously was undergoing 5-ALA thrusting guided surgery, and we have pre versus post 5-ALA. And you'll notice that the number of events here, you could say, well, it's so similar. It's, if anything, it's actually you have more particles in pre-5-ALA. Now, plasma sorting is, a, is a, obviously a, a beast on its own. It requires its own optimization and all of that. Um, and so that's something that we're doing. Uh, but what the interesting thing is that we, we showed here, um, we noticed here, is that when you look at the, when you gate the populations, the pre-5-ALA are very different from the post-5-ALA because they tend to be bigger and uh, more in aggregate. They, they tend to be, they scattered very differently as compared to the post-5-ALA. So again, uh, telling us that they're, they're most likely, they're quite different. So the other thing that we did, well, well, we said, again, these are very few number of vesicles, but let's see if we can actually get any RNA information out of these. And that's what we did. So we tried to look at the whole transcriptome uh, RNA seeks from these vesicles. So uh, this is a little bit of a flow chart. Um, we, I'm not sure how much time I have, but I'm almost done. Um, so we took the proportion positive EVs from cell lines. We've also tried plasma. And then you, um, we extracted the RNA and uh, uh, you get the bioanalyzer, you try to make sure you have some RNA. And then we use this kit that you see here, the UPX whole transcriptome kit, which is a Kyogen kit. Um, what I like about this kit is that um, it allows, and maybe other kits can do this, I don't know, but at least for us, this is uh, straightforward. And it claims that it can um, sequence RNA as low as 10 picograms. So it's, it's, it has a lot of, um, I'm sure it's not the best way or, you know, but at least considering with the amount that we're starting with, and, you know, this is all, like I said, pretty exploratory and it's, it works. And so it worked for us here, at least it was worth to try. And the analysis also is pretty straightforward because you do everything on gene globe. So you don't have to spend your, you know, weeks and months in trying to understand what gene signatures you have. So we did that and uh, we, this is uh, what I'm showing you on condition media and uh, uh, I have to move these bars around here otherwise. So we have condition media here and I'm, I'm showing, um, so condition media is what we call a total EVs, right? So there's no purification, no pre-processing. So if you compare your condition media or total EVs to the protoporphin positive EVs now, you can actually create uh, all these down and up regulated types of RNAs that you can go and look for and try to understand what, what's going on, why is one or the other. And this is from cell lines. Um, and let's see what else I have here. Oh, so I, 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 like I said, this is work in process, in, in progress. So we, we, we're not ready to, you know, at, at some point we'll put a paper around this, but we, w Again, this is just proof of principle that we actually can look at the RNAs inside these protoporphin positive vesicles. And so that's, uh, that's quite exciting for us. Um, so last thing that I'm gonna mention is that again, 5-ALA has, um, uh, has been looked at in other types of tumors. And most, um, most uh, actually the part that I didn't mention is photodynamic therapy because this generates a light, you can actually come in with a laser light and uh, if it's a surface, a tumor, so for example, melanomas or, or other surface tumors, it has been used and you can um, come in, so if you, you can just apply 5-LA, so the patient doesn't have to drink it, but you could apply and then you come in with the laser light and then you can actually target those cells, right? That's photodynamic therapy that I didn't even mention. But there, uh, in, in terms of, of um, surgical resection removal, it has been used for other cancers as well. Um, or it's been investigated at least. Meningiomas is something that they're doing quite extensively and there is a clinical trial that should start on it quite soon. Low-grade gliomas, there are some studies that it actually works in, in some of these uh, cells at least. Uh, Non-small lung, cell lung cancer, pancreatic cancer, and bladder cancer. So 
so there is enough evidence out there that actually this can work um, in, uh, in prostate cancer. I should mention that to you also for Dolores. It's not here, but for prostate cancer, it's been used for photodynamic therapy for, for many years, or many years been explored, I should say. So um, what we did here is try to do really the same experiments where we uh, add 5-ALA to the cells and we um, quantify their vesicles. So we have, again, the same cell lines here that you've seen before, U87s, uh, 293Ts, UML, which is a melanoma cell line, and normal fibroblasts. So these would be untreated, and then these are 5-ALA treated cells. And you can see here the, in, the full change as to before and untreated and non, and treated. And so you see, again, the diversity, the range of EV release in different types of cells. And so, again, that's interesting. And that's, um, that's something that um, part of it could be, again, how much they convert this 5-ALA. But part of it probably is also telling us about the rate of release of EVs from different cell lines. Um, uh, sorry, so this was cells. Sorry, I take that back. So this is the cells and how much they convert 5-ALA. Um, and then this is the EVs. And so you can see the rate of release, sorry, in different cell lines. Um, and you can see the one thing, for example, this UML cell line that um, for a long time, we actually um, had seen that based on nanocyte, that it actually secreted always a very low number of cell or EVs, almost close to, to normal host cells. And so um, this was work that I had done many years ago, just really for previous studies. And it was interesting to see this being confirmed here with this completely different system that UMELS, this melanoma cell lines also secretes very few um, EVs. And again, this GLI 36 v 3 cells, like I told you, that more oncogenic the cell, the higher the number of EVs that it releases. Um, I think this is it. This is all I wanted to show you. So we have a system where we can, uh, that we have developed that we can use uh, based on imaging flow cytometry where we can de detect these fluorescent uh, vesicles. Um, you can use astros in, astros in parallel um, if you have one to sort. There are a few other instruments as well. That's the one we have here. Um, and then this 5-LA obviously based liquid biopsy is really interesting for us for gliomas and hopefully it can be applied to other cancers as well. Um, at this point, the FDA label obviously is only for, for high-grade gliomas. And just want to acknowledge um, Anu Deep, who actually did all of this work, I should say, uh, from the first uh, um, optimization steps on the, on the IFC to the latest data on sorting. Uh, he's been driving all of this uh, with a lot of excitement and a lot of, uh, a lot of hard work behind this. Um, Yonita, like I said, is a person that has the Astros and John Tiggs over at the Beth, uh, Beth Israel and um, our funding sources. And I thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. It's a great talk and a very promising use of 5-ILA uh, and then the extracellular vesicles and imaging with the uh, flow cytometry. So we've got a few questions here lining up already. So I'll start with Dolores. So, uh, so this is very interesting, Leonora. I do have, um, a couple of questions. The one is, why are you saying that you're only interested in the small EV populations and you are excluding the Why do you think the larger vesicles are clusters? I uh, you mean on IFC? Mm -hmm. Well, because uh, we, this is, I'm not, so I'm not saying, I'm not using the same definition that you use when you say large or small EVs. This is what we see on IFC, and uh, it's a more of a, of a matter of whether we can, uh, whether it's positive on channel 11, for example, or, or whether it's a, a, you know, agglomerates that we can, we can tell that they're sort of, uh, they're not single EVs. And so you can distinguish agglomerates. You, you can see agglomerates. You can see, you, you can see when some, so the, the first gating that I mentioned is something called aspect, um, um, the area and the aspect ratio. And mm -hmm. um, that actually measures, uh, like I said, IFC has so many settings that you can literally answer so many questions. 
what that one that we look at is something that considers a vesicle something that is it has it's a perfect circle so you can actually look at uh, the type of vesicles that you're studying you can say if anything does not have this a perfect aspect uh, area and aspect ratio i'm going to exclude it and so we so also when we were doing this work i mean again early on we had so i don't I'm not saying that the large vesicles may not be representative of the, may not have protoporphyrin 9 and may not be useful. The, the challenge is how do, you, how do you separate them from debris? If they are true large vesicles and they are you know, carrying this one. Um, and when we did this work early on, we were not able to get these good correlations with how much we put in, how much we read out and all of that. And again, because I think they're closer to um, to the large aggregates that we are not, uh, we're not able to properly analyze. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I also have another question. You mentioned that the uh, CFDA positive vesicles are not all positive for um, ALA, uh, but are all the vesicles positive for CFDA or do you have also negative vesicles? Um, so we have, so we can't tell, right? We don't know for sure. So what we know for sure is that it's, it's a little bit of the chicken and the egg. Like, how do you know that what you're measuring, how do you know that you're measuring all of them? So, um, so we, that's why I didn't present that work because we haven't really, um, really sorted it out properly, but we know that a population of vesicles will have CFTA and 5LA. And then there will be another population that will have CFDA and um, maybe EGFRB3, but not, C, not ALA, right? Yes. So you have all these combinations, and it's really hard to say what that 100 number looks like. Okay. Um, so you might have also a population that is completely negative, but you don't even quantify, you cannot quantify We that. don't know that one, right? That's the problem. Like that's, we don't have a way of quantifying if it if it's not, uh, doesn't have a light. Okay, let's go to somebody else. Maybe I'll, I'll, I have some more questions, but I can ask later. Okay, so we, we go to Elham now to ask her questions. Hi, Elham. Hi, Leonora. Very interesting talk. Thanks. I am, I think I'm just following up on um, Dolores' question. Could you elaborate more on the size of vesicles that you were interested, what protocol you used, and why did you decide to specifically look for this subpopulation? Because as Dolores mentioned, you mentioned that you were interested in the bigger size vesicle and you were showing some preliminary data for your like um, controls on 100 and 200 nanometer. Is that the size of vesicle that you were interested? So a small size? So, like small we, we didn't have a, I would say that we didn't have a target. We just were looking for a real signal. And so, um, we, and I have actually, I think Anu's on the call if he wants to jump in because he's the one who optimized this. Um, but we were not, like I said, we were looking for um, a, the signal to be there when we put in the EVs and the signal to disappear when it, and when it would disappear, right? If we're not able to remove a signal with the lysis or with a different quantification or addition dilution curve, then to us that was not a real signal. And so, um, and the, the high scattering particles uh, were not very easy for us to look at in this system. And so, again, it doesn't mean, and I, I, guess, um, I guess I should say that we actually, I cannot exclude that those vesicles would not uh, be a, a different population and telling us something different. But I would say that we, um, yeah, we only explored the smaller vesicle just because they were a little bit easier to separate from the background. That's what I would say. Um, and also in plasma, it becomes even more challenging when you have a lot of background. Um, so that's another reason why it felt, uh, we felt more comfortable going with this population that we could uh, reliably follow. So is um, that a 100K <laughs> pellet that no, you were in? No. No, 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 we didn't. So we use the, um, we actually are using direct uh, plasma or media. So we're not pre-processing them in any way. We just, um, um, if it's media, we will do a low speed spin, uh, we'll filter through a 0.8 and then uh, we will run that on the image stream. And if it's plasma, 
same thing. We will separate the plasma from the whole blood. We will um, filter through a 0.8 and then run directly on image stream. Or, uh, sorry, not directly. I, we, should, we actually have to do several dilutions to make sure that we get to the right concentration, but uh, no other processing or isolation step. Okay, okay, thank you. Okay, so next question is Kelly. Uh, hey, Leonora, thank you for your talk. It was very nice. I have a question about your cells in culture. Did you see some difference between uh, the cell size and the quantity of the EVs that you isolate? Because I'm seeing a lot of my cultures, if my cells are larger, bigger, uh, they you produce much more EVs than, for example, when I work with immune cells that are really small. Did you see some difference on your culture? <laughs> That's a really interesting question. I think I've also, in the back of my mind, wondered about that many times. I think um, the easiest answer is actually the U87 uh, cells. Uh, if you see from the data that I showed, from mm -hmm. the last part on the ALA and other cancers. Um, mm -hmm. U87 actually has the highest number of uh, vesicles that are secreted, but they tend to have to be pretty tiny cell or at least small body. They do have a lot of uh, projections, but their cell body is quite small. Mm -hmm. In LA36, on the other hand, for example, the wild type is the one that uh, they, they, they're sort of more contained. They have, but they have, they probably, their, their cell bodies Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'd say four or five times that of U87. And so in, even within those cells, GLA36 had less EVs uh, mm -hmm. per cell, at least secreted. In parallel, also the cells that I showed, the same cell line, GLA36 wild type, any GFRB3, it's the same cell line, except that one of them has the oncogenic uh, EGFR in there. And mm -hmm. again, the ones with EGFRB3 secreted uh, a lot more EVs than the wild type cells. Mm -hmm. Let me see. Well, that's cool. Okay, uh, we have another question from Maria. Could you please unmute yourself? Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for the um, presentation. I have a question regarding the isolation of EVs from um, of plasma. So did you use any enrichment um, of a step for EV isolation, for example, any a specific, uh, it is specific for the brain tissue. Um, yeah, some kind of neuronal marker or something. So you mean it as a control or in parallel or just for this ALA um, readout? Mm -hmm. So um, the way we do it here, we just, we don't use any CNS markers, any enrichment step, nothing. We just literally take the plasma we do, depending if it's IFC or the astros, there will be a different dilution factor. I think IFC, maybe it's, I don't know, one in 10. Anu can correct me, he's on the line. But say we dilute the plasma one in 100 or one in 10. We literally would take one microliter of plasma, add it with some clean, sterile filtered PBS and run it on the stream. Okay. Yeah, I think I was just wondering, maybe LA may, may end up somewhere else, not in the brain and yeah. well so that's part of uh, yeah in the beginning i was mentioning that 5ala has been used um is now used in in the clinic right for, for, for surgeries and so it has the fda approval so before it got the approval obviously they've done all these studies so it's it's pretty um at least within the cns uh, it's pretty specific to the glioma cells um, so it shouldn't be. Now, I don't know. We, I can't exclude that it's not going somewhere else um, in some small tissue somewhere, but it, we don't think so. And again, the, um, the correlation between the tumor size and the EV counts in the plasma that I showed you earlier, that's also, I think, a pretty robust um, Point, um, uh, point of strength to show that really the, the more most likely they are coming from the tumor cells themselves. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, it looks like I missed a question from Alan Ezrin. Please go ahead. Alan Ezrin, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Hi, Leonora. Good to see you. Nice talk. Good to see um, you, Alan. So I wanted to ask a question, and then I want to go back to Mariette's earlier question. You had mentioned in passing that you had uh, co-screened for tenacin C. 
Did you see any correlation between the porphyrin 9 signal and the presence or absence of tenacin C? Oh, um, I'm going to ask Anu again. He probably remembers better. Anu, are you on the call? Hello. Yeah, yeah, I am. Do you remember so, the uh, overlap between tenacin C and 5-ALA? So, uh, with CFDA and ALA, we have done the overlap study, but with tenacin C, we were still optimizing tenacin oh, alone. Yeah. So That's we right. don't have the answer, but uh, the lab is shut down and once it resumes, we're going to do all those experiments. So That's right. I don't have an yeah, answer. So I right take that now. back. So we tried, yeah. uh, so we tried CFDA then, 5-ALA, and what was the other yes. marker? We tried uh, that combination, but that's all. But with Tennyson, we just did Tennyson alone. Oh, yeah, we did Tennyson C alone. Yeah. Was, uh, yeah. We had the wrong um, label, the wrong uh, color, and which overlap with CFDA. Exactly. So, so that, yes. So we Again, don't have any Alan, but we'll definitely, that's something that we're definitely looking into and we'll, we'll get that done for sure. It'd be interesting um, if Dr. Jones has uh, some adenocarcinoma samples coming from her uh, upcoming study. Uh, that might be something interesting. And then if you need any uh, monoclonal for tenacin C, give me a shout. Uh, so in the way of introduction, um, we did a similar line of reasoning um, back in 2015 with um, U87s in culture, and they would take up 5-ALA and viable malignant uh, genotyping tissue will convert readily over to porphyrin 9. It's interesting to note, though, that uh, 5-ALA will go everywhere, and every cell in the body, every cell in culture will make porphyrin 9. There's something wrong with malignant tissue in that when it makes porphyrin 9, it does so at a much faster rate, and the porphyrin 9 doesn't necessarily egress by an ABCG2 transporter, and we think it's mainly uh, vesicular egression uh, that's responsible for seeing porphyrin 9 uh, in the culture or in plasma. And we did about 20 patients uh, that were dosed. Um, we're the uh, team that uh, brought 5-ALA to the FDA for approval for visualization. And it just happens, uh, some of you may be aware of our interest in exosomes from many, many years back. So we asked the question, could they be circulating? And what we found in plasma is um, we see about 0.01% of the total population. And this was done on a nanosite with a special red laser to be able to count particles that had porphyrin-9 in them versus the uh, typical uh, white laser for uh, particle counting. And I'm not a fan of the nanosite, as you know, but it was an interesting ability to quantitate porphyrin-9. And um, we saw about 10 to the eighth particles per mil plasma in the patients who had been dosed. We followed them from three hours post-dosing out to about six weeks after dosing. And the surprise was that you see these porphyrin-9 um, particles if they indeed come from the tumor, which I do believe they do, um, stick around for about two weeks. Uh, and again, they're autologous, so it's a very different clearance mechanism than an exogenous uh, labeled exosome uh, given to a mammal. Uh, the other important piece that we saw is we asked the question that I believe Mariette uh, alluded to, and we did not see any particles that had porphyrin-9 that would light up with an integrin like alpha V beta three. So we don't think they're of endothelial origin. And we didn't see anything that looked like it was from myeloid of uh, a GB2B 3A. So they're not coming from marrow, but mm -hmm. they could be coming from anywhere. But the interesting part was that uh, we did see a good correlation with tenacin C, which is a unique neoantigen for highly proliferative tissue and for EGFR V3 in those patients who were V3 positive. So we, we kind of believe that they are tumor origin, um, but that's a piece yet to be totally secured. But um, you don't see a lot of porphyrin-9 metabolism in non-malignant tissue. So that's our summary of what we did many years ago. And I'm just pleased to see that uh, Leonora and her team have picked this up and continued pushing the frontiers forward. Nicely done. Great. Thank you very much uh, for that comment. Um, we have another question from Zubair. Hello. Yeah, go ahead, please. Hi, uh, hi, uh, great talk. I was just wondering, um, have you by any chance done any um, cryo TEM or correlative TEM on your vesicles to confirm oh. structure and correlate with the fluorescence by, by any overlapping imaging techniques? 
Yeah, so that's a really good point. We have not done uh, EM on the vesicles. Um, we have um, the we the challenges again. Um, if we're looking for five for for, the floor, for protoporphyrin nine, it's very unstable. So if we were to if we had a way, if we had the right channel to do EM, and then we isolate these vesicles, and by the time we get there, we probably lose the fluorescence. So that's a challenge, a little bit of doing the downstream work on these type of types of vesicles. Um, okay. So no, the answer is no, and it would be challenging at this point to maintain that fluorescence. Just a thought: we we in our lab in in Nottingham in UK, we've been doing some single EV analysis to isolate fluorescent EVs freeze them or plunge freeze them and then locate single vesicles and collate their uh, lipid bilayer structures. We've been do doing them for some fluorescent molecules just stable, but um, just to let you know that it's a possibility as well. Maybe in the future, maybe in the near future. Yeah, yeah thank you for that. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, we had some ideas in trying to preserve the, the fluorescence, I think, and Alan was also, had recommended some things to try, but we haven't tried yet. This is, again, relatively new work, and then we went back to try and reproduce it and trying the sorting, and then we were all uh, told to stay home. So we, when we get back, we'll for sure start this again. Thank <laughs> yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think um, that's all of the questions. So I guess um, I actually only have one question. So can you comment on uh, what is the stage of the glioma that you can detect? Is that sort of like, can you detect like the early one or, and, um, and then also, you know, because the five ALA seems to target the tumor. So when you do a surgery, the tumor is gone. So is there any sort of application can be utilized after that? So uh, again, I mean, I'm sure Alan would 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 love to to tackle this. And yeah, there's so many ways that we we are thinking of this. Um, so, but the the easiest thing I'll say. So, as I said, the FDA label right now is for high grade gliomas, but that doesn't mean that it's not going to happen to some extent, at least in other cells. And so, um, it's this. And again, this this it's it's the accumulation where the extra happens. That's what we're looking for, right? And so um, we we are go we are looking again once we get back to it. We are, we I'm hoping to look at the different range of glioma cells actually to see the rate, the type the number of EVs and how much protoporphyrin we get from these cells. So that's something that I can do myself. Now Alan can probably comment on where the FDA where they stand with the trials in terms of the low grade gliomas. As I mentioned, I think he's he's pretty uh, on with a uh, with pretty um, far ahead with the meningioma trial, but the um, the other thing that, um, what was your second part of the question, sorry? The, um, yeah, so after the surgery, um, yeah. so you know, most of the right. tumor are gone. Yeah. yeah, so we we think that they can be used when there's a tumor, right? You can drink this and then two or three hours later, we can take the blood before and after and we can see ideally if there's a tumor. The, the most exciting application that we think this can be used is the, in the recurrent cases. As I mentioned, they're, they're, the questions that you can try to answer before and after, they can be very different. And all patients die because of the recurrent tumor. So, and a lot of patients, when the tumor recurs, they actually cannot go a second surgery. And a lot of times you will need a surgery to confirm that there's a tumor and that can be important for new ter therapies or clinical trials and all of that. So we, it would be so exciting if we could at some point with the proper paperwork and the proper approvals, if we could go to the recurrent patients and say, when you come back with, uh, with the potential uh, uh, recurrence, uh, we take the MRI. We're not sure if it's a tumor yet, uh, but let's give you 5-ALA and we'll take your blood before and we'll take your blood after, and then we're going to analyze this. And as I mentioned, this 5-ALA conversion does not happen very, at least not very efficiently when the tumor is, or doesn't happen when the tumor is dead, right? When, when the cells are dead. So there has to be an actively growing tumor. So that would be the most exciting one that I can think of. And I'm sure, you know, Alan would, uh, could comment probably on that a lot more than I can. Uh, you're spot on, Leonora. And um, the approval for 5-ALA worldwide, and we've used it in about 80,000 patients over the last decade, um, is for the visualization of um, high-grade or suspected high-grade glioma. Unfortunately, when they do a resection, you typically only get about 
36% of the population that you get a gross total resection. So a lot of times we leave tumor behind, we just don't see it. And that's why uh, at its current use, it's valuable to increase the number of the patients that you can actually get a complete resection. But as Leonora uh, shared with us vision for the future, the ideal setting would be a molecular diagnostic because it is the only agent that is a metabolic indicator of malignant. But uh, the real issue is, as Leonora indicated, a bedside diagnostic for the differentiation in a recurrent setting between pseudoprogression, which is truly necrosis, and true tumor recurrence. Uh, we don't know what that really looks like before we go into surgery. And about 40% of the population actually have false progression. It's just a continuous continuation of the tumor death, which should be identifiable in plasma EVs. Um, if you've got true tumor coming back, you'll be making porphyrin 9 uh, loaded EVs from the tumor. And I think that's the big break in this field if we could identify the 40% of the population who really don't need to be debulked. But we don't know that until we can get a biopsy sample. Mm -hmm. So the patient diagnostic that way would be something very, very revolutionary. Okay. Um, I think that's all the questions that we've got. And um, thank you very much for uh, the great talk and also great discussions and Alan for adding up into the um, answer. Um, I think uh, today we learned a lot about the gliomas itself and also how to use flow cytometry and how to use the fluorescence in EVs to detect a high grade tumor. So um, with that, I, I will conclude this session. So next week, 